All right, if you don't mind, wherever you are this morning, if we could stand up for the reading of God's word today. Uh, if you're new with us, uh, real simply, we're a Bible-believing church, so what we like to do in our weekend services is as we get into God's word, we like to take just a moment to stand up and to honor God's word and just to honor him. And, you know, I always believe it's not, you know, hey, not what does Pastor Matt have to say to me this morning, but God, what do you have to say to me through your word. And uh, we've been in a series on relationships. We've titled it Next Level Relationships. You know, at the end of your life and mine, really what matters are our relationships. You know, I got a call this week, um, slightly of an uh, unexpected phone call that my, my uncle passed away, my uncle in Toledo, my dad's brother. And he was just such a wonderful man. Uh, he, was, he was a family man, he was devoted, he was a hard worker, he loved God. And uh, that was hard to get that phone call this week. In fact, when the services are over, Christy and I and the kiddos are packing up to head to Toledo. The family's asked uh, me to officiate the funeral this week on Tuesday. And you know, I, I think about his life and what a legacy he left. I mean, he was just such a wonderful man. And I think about your life and mine. You know, at the end of your life and mine, What's going to matter? I can tell you how much money you made is not going to matter. What kind of house you lived in isn't really going to matter. At the end of the day, what matters are our relationships. The people that are with us in those moments when we're getting ready to go to, that's what matters. And so your relationships, no matter how good they are, maybe your relationships are wonderful today. They can get better and if any of your relationships are struggling today, there's hope that they can get better. And that's been the whole premise of this series. Week one, we talked about friendship and the fact that it's not that we need more friends, we just need um, deeper friendships. Week two, we talked about some foundation principles of, of next level relationships. Week number three, we talked about communication, the art of communication. Married couples report that is the number one thing that married couples struggle with the most is communicating one with another. Pastor Andrew did a wonderful job last week talking about conflict and, and dealing with conflict properly. How many of you know conflict doesn't have to end a relationship? That conflict happens in every relationship. It's how we deal with it that matters the most. Our relationships can actually get stronger, richer, deeper after we deal with conflict in a healthy way. Well, today what I want to talk to you about, it's Father's Day, and this is for men, this is for women, this is for fathers, this is for mothers, this is for all of us. I want to talk to you about leaving a legacy. When you and I leave this world, what's the wake of our life going to be? Like a boat has a wake that follows behind it. What's the wake of your life going to be? What's your legacy going to be to your kids, your grandkids, your family members, those that knew you, those that loved you? What will you be remembered for? How will people's lives be different because your life was lived so well? We're going to go ahead and look at an incredible young man in Scripture in the New Testament. His name was Timothy. And uh, Timothy was a sharp young man. God used him mightily in the New, early New Testament times. And what we find is that him becoming such a powerful young man of God was no mistake. There were people in his life that caused him to become the man that he was. We're going to go ahead and look at a few verses here. Verses 1 through 7, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. He was not the biological father of Timothy, but he was his spiritual father. So this is what Paul says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, his son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. He's in prison right now and Timothy was really upset that he was about ready to be martyred for the faith. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded, notice this here, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Lord, we just ask that you add your blessing to this time in your word, that each and every one of us would leave a godly, impactful legacy behind us. 
in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You can be seated today. Well, again, happy Father's Day to all of you guys. We had a wonderful time yesterday. Uh, we hosted a men's breakfast yesterday, and we had over 130 men show up. Uh, the gym was packed full of men, and I want to give, once again, a big shout out to everybody that helped with that. Pastor Dan did a wonderful job organizing that event. Uh, I want to thank Ed Edmonds. He did a fantastic job. He did a bunch of cooking for us. Uh, Jackie Burkhart, who runs our hospitality team, she had a whole team of people there working and serving, and to all those that cleaned up, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. And what made it so wonderful is the gentleman that we had speak to us yesterday. Um, Mr. Tom McDaniels spoke to our men yesterday, and wow, what a powerful talk that was. We are so blessed that eight years ago, I didn't even realize it had been quite that long, eight years ago in 2016, Tom McDaniels was looking for a church and he came to our church on Woodlawn and he sat up in the balcony and some weeks later he moved down to the floor and now every week he's in town and not traveling, he's here at church. He oftentimes shows up here at 5 a.m. in the mornings and helps us load up all our stuff or he'll help us to, to wrap everything up at the end of the service. He's an incredible man and if you know him, many of you know him, he is a legendary a high school football coach right here. He coached Canton McKinley from, uh, amen, I hear some people shouting that down. Uh, a lot of McKinley fans. Uh, he coached there from 1982, I believe, till up to about 1998. He coached there for all of those years, led them, as you know, to many championships and city titles. And what was interesting, in 1997, the USA Today they basically named Canton McKinley as the number one high school team in the whole nation. He, isn't that incredible? He was awarded Coach of the Year for all of America by the USA Today. Um, just an incredible man. And what I love about him is the, the love he has for his dear wife and his family. The legacy that Tom McDaniels has left in the lives of, of students that he taught young men that he coached, and his family. Many of you know his family. Uh, he has two sons that coach in the NFL and in many different roles. And uh, obviously, Josh McDaniels uh, was a longtime offensive coordinator for the Patriots. He was, he was uh, Tom Brady's offensive coordinator for all those Super Bowls. And his son, Ben, coach, was the quarterback's coach at Michigan. I'm just, <clears throat> sorry about that, I'm just saying. Um, now he's the receivers coach for the Houston Texans. And uh, in fact, the Hall of Fame game, we gave some tickets away to the Hall of Fame yesterday game that's coming up in August. The Houston Texans are playing in that. So Ben will be here uh, in, in Canton that week. So it, it's just exciting to see. They have another son who I just found out is becoming a doctor. I mean, you look at the, the legacy that Tom McDaniels has left. And what was amazing yesterday is when he came in, he didn't talk about football, didn't talk about all the experiences and successes. When Tom McDaniel spoke to us yesterday, he talked about the impact that Jesus Christ has made in his life. And honestly, that, we were just blown away at his talk. And what was amazing is he talked about the worship that he enjoys at church. And here's what was pretty cool, bless my heart. Uh, every week when you walk in, we give you sermon notes. It's a little handout. You can fill out those sermon notes and take them home and go over it for the week. Tom McDaniels, for the last eight years of attending Woodlawn Church, has kept every sermon note I have put out that he's been here for. For He keeps them in a binder and categorizes them Old Testament and New Testament. He told me that yesterday. I was like, blown away that he would do that. I mean, what a man. But here's the legacy. We had to actually pull football talk out of him. We had to do a Q&A to get him to talk about football yesterday. His kids are all serving Jesus Christ. And that's what's most important at the end of the day. And you know, you think about legacy, your legacy and my legacy. What's gonna matter that we live? What kind of impact are we going to make in this world? You know, I was thinking about my uncle that just passed. I was thinking about Tom McDaniels. And 
Uh, there's a scripture in the Bible that, that, that blesses my heart. It's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse seven. It says, the righteous man who walks in integrity and lives life in accord with his godly beliefs, how blessed are his children after him who have his example to follow. Man, that, that scripture gives me goosebumps when I read it. To think about that you and I can live our lives, male or female, in such a way, especially if you're a parent, that blessed are your children, blessed are your grandchildren that follow because of the life that you and I live. You and I have the power to make an impact long after we're in heaven, long after we have leave, left this world, we have an opportunity to make an impact. But on the flip side, we also can leave a not so good legacy. And maybe some of you have experienced that with your family members or somebody that you knew or somebody that you know that it's possible to leave a great legacy and it's a possible to leave not such a great legacy. In fact, there's a, a story in the book of 1 Kings about a king. His name was King Bashan and he was one of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. Solomon's son made a bad decision and it ended up splitting the kingdom under Solomon's son's reign and 10 of the 12 tribes went to the north they were called Israel, and two of the tribes stayed in the south, and they were known as Judah. Well, this particular king, Bashan, happened to be one of the kings of the northern tribe of Israel, and this is what the Bible says about him. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. So the Bible says that this king followed after the legacy of a king a couple generations before him whose name was Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first king of that northern kingdom and God spoke to him and God wanted to use him to bring them back to true worship that David led the people in. But instead of honoring God, he led the people into idol worship. And because he led them into idol worship, his example and his legacy was that the generations after him and the kings after him, instead of serving God, worshiped idols and led all of Israel, that northern kingdom, to sin. All, and that's what the Bible says, and walked in the way of Jeroboam. All throughout the Old Testament, you see that. He walked in the way and did evil like his father did, or, or he served God wholeheartedly like his father did. That you and I, mothers, fathers, whoever we are, we have an opportunity to leave a wake behind us that will cause people to live for God or not. And so when we think about legacy, if I could give you a, maybe a simple definition is legacy is about others buying into our beliefs and values and following them when we're not around. Because what we leave behind, it has a true worth. So when you look at legacy, it means that the people around us that respect us, that know us and love us, they buy into our beliefs. They buy into our values. And when we're not there anymore, they're still living those things out because of the impact that we made. Because what we left behind in those beliefs and in those va values are, are of true worth, are of value. So they want to live those things out because of what they were given. And so when you look at this relationship here between uh, Paul and Timothy, you see that Timothy was a fantastic young man. He was a young man that ended up serving with Paul on some of his missionary journeys. He did special missions, spiritual missions for, for Paul. He ended up leading um, one of the great churches of the early New Testament, the church at Ephesus, which was probably the first mega church. There was tens of thousands of people that went to that church, and Timothy ended up for a while, for a season, being the pastor of that church. He was a fantastic young man. But again, it just didn't happen. He didn't just wake up one day and he was this young man that had a heart for God, to follow God, to make an impact in the world. Look what Paul said about him. And the Message Bible says it really good. It says, that precious memory triggers another, your honest faith. And what a rich faith it is. He's complimenting this faith, this genuine faith that Timothy has. But look, it was handed down from your grandmother Lois to your mother Eunice and now to you. And the special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you and prayed 
keep that ablaze. So right there, you see three people that left a legacy in Timothy's life that caused him to become the young man that he was. And it began with a grandmother. Can I speak to the grandparents today? You are important. You have a vital role in the lives of your grandchildren. In fact, I am the product of a godly grandmother. My, my grandmother went to heaven in 1999, and that was the mother of my uncle that just passed. She was an incredible woman of God. I stand here today because of her impact in my life and our family. All of my cousins are serving God today because of her impact, her wake of her life. She was not wealthy when she passed. She lived in a one-bedroom apartment in Mommy for Social Security, but I want to tell you what she did give us. She didn't, she didn't leave her family a big inheritance. She left us something much more important. She left us faith. That woman prayed for me, spoke into my life, and I stand here today, large in part because of her, because of my aunt, who also was always been on fire for God and spoken to our family. And then from there, you see that he, so he had, first of all, Timothy had his grandmother, Lois, then his mother, Eunice, received that faith, and then it was passed on through the grandmother and through the mother to Timothy, and then you see another person in here, which is Paul. And Paul became like a spiritual father to Timothy. You see, Timothy had a father. The Bible said he was Greek, nothing wrong with that, meaning that he was a Gentile, and many Bible scholars believe his father was not a believer. So his mother and grandmother were believers, but his father was not. Some scholars believe his father may have passed away and wasn't even in the picture at the time. So he was lacking that role model, spiritual role model in his life, and that's where Paul came in. And that's why I say you don't have to be a mother, you don't have to be a father to invest in somebody's life spiritually. You can be a spiritual father. You can be a spiritual mother. After I gave my life to God, rededicated my life as a young man and got on fire for ministry, I had a pastor, Pastor Tony Scott, who I served for 20 years. I spent 20 years serving in his ministry, all total. And for 16 of those, I spent on his staff as a staff member. And I want to tell you what today, we're getting ready in August to celebrate his 50th year in ministry. And we're going to go to Toledo. Zach, Zach served there for a while. We're going to go there and celebrate what he has done. But I can tell you, I learned so much from him, how to be a pastor. When I finally became a lead pastor, I didn't make some of the mistakes that other young guys did because I had a role model, somebody I had learned from. He taught me the ropes of ministry. He was a praying man. And so all of those things made an indelible impact on my life. So I want to ask you a couple questions this morning. You don't have to answer them to anybody but yourself. And here they are. Here's number one. Whose fingerprints are on your life and your faith? Think about that for a minute. Chances are, if you're a believer here today, there was somebody that God used or, or people that God used on your journey to get you where you are today. Who were those people? What fingerprints are on your life and who impacted your life? Here's the second thing, and that is, whose life do you have the power to impact? Do you have a son or a daughter or a grandchild? Do you have a friend, uh, maybe God's positioned you at, at work or, or in a place where you can invest in somebody else's life. Who in your sphere of influence do you have power to impact for Christ? How can you leave a godly legacy in that person's life? And then here's my last question. What kind of legacy are you leaving? Are, are you leaving a good legacy? And I know when I say this, that people that are watching online or might be here, you might feel some guilt, like, you know, maybe I wasn't the best dad or the best mom or I didn't, I didn't do this. Listen, don't, don't live in guilt and condemnation. The idea is what do we do from here on out to make sure that the legacy that we leave behind is a lasting, impactful one. Because here's the problem. Most of the time we live our lives focusing on the here and now. We live on thinking about our day-to-day -day issues and problems and we don't take the time to think about the legacy that will follow us after we're gone. So that, say, that being said, I want to give you a couple things here today that will help you and I in leaving that legacy, that long after we're gone, we've impacted the next generation. Here's number one, and that is that a legacy is caught as much as it is taught. 
What I mean by that, to, to, to leave a legacy and to mentor somebody in the faith does not mean you sit them down and you just teach them the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Some of you are like, I don't even know that much about the Bible that way. Here's what you need to know. People really become discipled through relationship because people are watching you. And if you take somebody along and, and serve God with that person, you can make an impact without even teaching a thing. And that's what we see here in Paul and Timothy's life. In the book of Acts, we see the first example of, of Tim, Timothy showing up in scripture. And the Bible says, this is speaking of Paul, then he came to Derby and Lystra and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Look at verse three. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. So, so here's the deal. Paul said, I see God's hand on that young man. That is a special young man. God wants to use him. So what he did is he invited Timothy to come along with him, to follow him. And so for many years, Timothy followed Paul, went on his missionary journeys and, and, and learned under Paul. He watched Paul preach. He watched Paul teach. He watched Paul defend the faith. He watched Paul be persecuted for his faith. He, he was right there with Paul every step of the way watching what was going on. And that's the biblical model. If you look back in the Old Testament, there was a great prophet named Elijah. And when he was gonna pick his predecessor, he picked a, a young man by the name of Elisha. And Elisha followed him. Elisha saw him do the miracles. And so it was through walking with him that he really learned the faith. When Jesus came, he, took to the, he said to the 12 disciples, what? Follow me, right? So they spent three years eating with Jesus, talking with Jesus, serving with Jesus, doing ministry with Jesus, watching Jesus do his miracles, watch Jesus refute the religious people. And so after Jesus left this earth and ascended to heaven, his legacy was what those 12 disciples did after he was gone. You and I are here because of them. And so you look at that and you can see the impact that you and I can make. I look at the, my pastor that I served under for all those years. When I became a lead pastor, I didn't make some of those mistakes that other young guys did because I'd learned from him. I saw him deal with difficult situations. I, I saw him dream big. I saw him pray hard. And every time I would walk by his office at three o'clock in the afternoon, I would hear him praying. I could hear him praying outside that door. I could hear him. And all of the, those things made an indelible impact on my life. And so the life you and I live, it's not so much what we teach we live our lives, it makes a difference. For those of us that are parents, there was a book that came out a few years ago called Sticky Faith, Sticky Faith. And the idea and the premise of the book was how do we make our faith sticky to the next generation? How do we ensure that our children and our grandchildren and the generations beyond us are living out this faith? And this is what she concluded, uh, Dr. Kara Powell, after all of her research, she said, how you express and live out your faith may have a greater impact on your son or daughter than anything else. So right there, it's not what we say, it's not necessarily what we teach, but it's how you and I live. Our kids are watching us. Your grandkids are watching you. How you and I handle difficult times how you resolve conflict with your spouse, how you honor God in your home, how you honor God in your personal life, your commitment to going to church, your commitment to the things of God. That, that more than what we say, it's literally how we live that makes the impact. And one of the things that I know is kids are sensitive to inconsistencies. When they see us say one thing and live a different way, it speaks a message. When they say us, see us say something and then live it, it makes an indelible impact. In fact, there was another uh, doctor, Dr. Christian Smith, this is what she concluded. She said, when it comes to kids' faith, parents get what they are. It's kind of a strong statement, but true. At the end of the day, as parents, we get what we are. So our kids will oftentimes be like us in our faith because of how we live it out in front of them on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, I had a great example of this. Last, last week, um, we got to visit a church because we were on vacation. By the way, we went on vacation last week. 
Pastor Andrew, y'all appreciate our team up here. These guys are awesome. And um, he did a wonderful job last week. And we got to go to Charlotte last week. Christy's brother lives in Charlotte. And uh, we had a wonderful time down there. Um, his wife and their kids are an amazing Amazing family. Our kids are very close with their cousins, so it's like we show up there and the cousins, they just take off and we see them like a few hours later, they're just having fun. And so we had a great time. We, we actually climbed up a mountain, like not too crazy, but it took like four hours to get up and get down. We were all panting, it was hot, but it was really fun. We got some stellar photos of that. The next day we went tubing down this river. They told us there was poisonous snakes in the river and that spooked Brady, so he could not wait for it to be over. Um, But we went down this thing, and it was just a very adventurous vacation. In fact, um, what was really cool is I have a bucket list, and y'all know I like to ride a motorcycle, and so we have a gentleman who plays on our band up here. He was playing this morning. His name's Jeff Castle, and uh, he happens to have a trailer that's set up to haul motorcycles, so it just so happens a couple weeks before we left for Charlotte, he said, hey, pastor, I just got the trailer finished. Anytime you want to haul your motorcycle, you just let me know. And at that moment, the the heavens opened and I heard an angel voice and I said, oh no, I can, okay. And uh, so I went home and I begged my wife if she would let me trailer my motorcycle down to Charlotte and she said, yes, thank you, honey. (laughs) And so we trailered my motorcycle down and Thursday, a Friday and Saturday of last week, the weather was really good and she said, honey, you need to go because I have a bucket list and I'm getting older and I haven't checked anything off the list. So it's time I get busy. I always wanted to ride the Blue Ridge Parkway. Anybody been down the Blue Ridge Parkway? Absolutely gorgeous. So I caught it up in Virginia and I just took off down the Blue Ridge Parkway. And then the next day I went to this place called the Tale of the Dragon. Ooh. It was actually crazy. It is a stretch of road that is 11 miles long and it has 318 curves. It was awesome. I mean, curves, like not like a curve like this, but a curve like this. They call them switchbacks. So for 11 miles, you're like in these curves and, and, uh, I, I, at the top, it's, it's famous. So at the top, they have souvenir shops and restaurants, and it's a big deal. And so I was in the souvenir shop before I rode the ride, and I'm like, listen, I can't buy a coffee cup or a, or a T-shirt until I've actually done it. You know, I'm not going to own something I haven't done. So I, I went, and I got on my bike, and I, my eyeballs were rather large, and I rode all the way down it. And when I got to the bottom, I'm like, now i got to get back to the souvenir shop. So I had to ride it twice. It was glorious. <laughs> They actually, because it's called the Tale of the Dragon, I went into the restaurant and I ate a dragon burger when I was done. It was awesome. I don't even know why I told you all that. Just felt like talking. (laughs) But the real reason I'm telling you that story is last Sunday we went to church at at Christie's brother's church and they go to a church very similar to ours and and they do like, they do multi, they do multi-site. So we went to one of the campuses that their church has And I was listening to the pastor speak and I really enjoyed his message. And he was talking about his father and how his father was such a godly man. And uh, he learned his faith through watching his father. And he said one, one particular occasion, his dad is a real big guy. He's like six foot four, big hulking guy. And he said one day they went to serve at a soup kitchen in the inner city. And they went there and he didn't, you know, this, this young man said, I didn't really know like, you know, how to behave in the soup kitchen. Like, what do you do? He said, but I just watched my dad. And my dad just started talking with all those guys and joking with them and just hanging out with them like it was his best friend, you know? And, and he said, I was just watching my dad interact and love on these guys. And he said, then it, later in the day, this real big guy walked up to him and said, hey man, he said, I, I, I really need a coat and, and no one has a coat my size at all these places where they give coats away. He looks at this pastor's dad. He says, hey, do you happen to have a coat that would fit me? And he said, I'll never forget. He said, my dad put me in the car, left immediately, put me in the car, drove 20 minutes away to our house, went in the closet, didn't find any jacket, found his two best jackets, threw them in the car, drove 20 minutes back and handed those jackets to that man. He said, in that moment, my dad preached a volume of sermons to me in one action. You see, it's not what we say, it's what we do that makes the difference in the lives of other people. 
So we live it and people are watching. We just take somebody along with you. That's really at the end of the day. That's what, that's what discipleship's all about. It's doing it together. That's why as your pastor, I always say, I don't think a Sunday morning service is enough. And I'm being honest when I say that. Because discipleship happens in community groups. We have 40 community groups that, 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 that go on in the spring and the fall every year. And it's your place that you can connect and get to know people and do this thing together with others. It's when you serve on serving teams and you start using your gifts and talents and doing that with other people that you grow and the discipleship journey happens. It doesn't just happen by sitting and receiving. It happens by connecting and doing. And so that's why it's so important that you as believers take a next step beyond just this step when you're ready to do that. Here's the second thing, I'll give you the last one pretty quick here, is look for teachable moments. You want to look for those moments that you can impart truth. In fact, this is what Paul told to Timothy later. He said, what you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So what he said to, to Timothy, he was worried that when he was gone and Timothy was going to be out teaching all these people, there was a lot of heresy going on around that time. And he said, listen, I've given you a blueprint. Use that blueprint to teach truth to the people. And so he put and in, in, in invested truth in, into uh, Timothy. And that's what you and I can do when we're mentoring somebody, when we're working with our kids. You look for those teachable moments. My wife, Christy, is masterful at this. Uh, she grew up in a great home. Her Christian parents, um, her dad is amazing. And one of the things that she said about her dad is her dad got saved shortly, like as they were being born and starting faith. So he's like, they said, my dad kind of grew in faith with us, she said. But she said, my dad was always so good at teachable moments. She said, we would be watching TV and something would be, a man would be treating a woman wrong and he'd pause it. And he would say, that's not how you treat a woman. That's not how we treat women. And any time throughout, what, if they were on vacation, if they were doing something, wherever they were at, if there was a moment he could impart truth practically, he did it. My wife is masterful at this. I see her do it every week in our home. When we're out at a restaurant, we're out somewhere, she'll stop and she'll just correct. She'll pause there. I give her the remote control. That's a lot of control I give, you know? <laughs> and uh, she'll pause it. If she's got something to say, I'll have something to say. But the idea is it's these teachable moments. We had one yesterday. My son Brady is a wonderful young man. He's getting larger and he's getting stronger. And I was in our home office yesterday preparing for you guys today and I heard my, my daughter screaming. And it's because my son whacked her in the face with a pillow. And she was screaming. Brady's turning red on the front seat. So I called the family together. Brady was standing there with that guilty look on his face. And, and I, I called the family together. And this was a teachable moment after he spent some time in his bedroom. And uh, we uh, brought the family together. And one of our core values here at the church is honor. We, we, we honor God and we honor other people. And uh, that's what we do in our home too. We honor your parents, you honor one another. And so we had a, we had a little time of talking yesterday about how we honor our sister and honor our brother and honor our parents. And my son is a wonderful young man, by the way, but he is the subject of a lot of my preaching. <laughs> Anyways, but it was a wonderful time to be able to stop and talk about honor. This is how you treat a woman. This is how you treat and, and, and it was a wonderful moment to do that. And we need to make sure that we do that. Here's the third thing is that when they're ready, you have to let them run and you have to let them succeed. You got to let them get out of the nest. You got to let them, you got to let them go. And that's what Paul did with Timothy. When he was ready, he started sending him places. I love what the Bible says right here. It says in Philippians 2.20, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I love what he says about Timothy. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. So he was, he was proud of Timothy. And so he started sending Timothy places. He'd send him on a mission here and send him on a mission here. Hey, you go ahead of us to Troas and you do the teaching over here. Oh, I want you to go to Ephesus. You stay there. You pastor that church for a while. He let Timothy go out there and fly. And because of that, sometimes as leaders, we can be so wanting to be controlling or parents. We want to be so controlling. We're the hover parent. 
and we never let them spread their wings and we never let people get out there and do what they've been called to do. I think as leaders, we have to mobilize the next generation and let them go and let them, let them lead. And it's, it's a healthy thing for the future and our legacy. But we need to make sure that we do that. Many mentors never let their mentees fly and you have to let them fly. And as, before I close the message, I wanted to bring a couple out to you that's very special to Christy and I, very, spe- very special to our church, uh, give to our church if, if Zach and Emily Howard would come out to you. Could y'all give them a big hand for what they do? So Zach and Emily have been our work coming up in August. Zach and Emily will be celebrating their 10th year as our worship leaders. Is that incredible or what? 10 years. Do you know the average tenure of a worship leader in a church is only two years. They've been here five times beyond that. And don't worry, they're not going anywhere. I was, when you have these talks, people are like, well, what's going on? Where they going? Anyway. Um, Zach and Emily have been such a precious couple to us. Um, when, when Paul said, I have no one else like him, you know, I, I, I say that in all my years of ministry, I don't know that I've worked with anyone quite like Zach. His heart, his humility, his character, the way he loves. I would send him anywhere, anytime as my representative because I fully trust him. If something's gonna get done, if there's a big event happening, oh, he's gonna get it done. Like, you know, if he has to stay up all night, I mean, that's just who he is. And um, we're gonna be honoring them in August along with Brittany Hartshorn, I called her Casto because she's been married since. I knew her first as Casto, and so I said the wrong thing earlier. But Brittany's been with us 10 years as well. So in August, because the first week of August will be their 10 year, we want to do a little celebration for them and let you guys bless them. But what we did mention is right now, uh, because we're getting ready to uh, open the other location here in September, We've been talking to Zach and Emily. I got together with the elders and the elders and I got together and blessed them with a little financial blessing, a little extra bonus there. And they're gonna be taking a few weeks off just to rex and relax. They're heading to Florida tomorrow. That's awesome, way to go. And um, so we wanted to bless them not only financially, but we wanted to bless them with time. Ministry is challenging and we need time off. So they're gonna have, the next three weekends, you're not gonna see them, but they're coming back. May, oh, yes, they're coming back, right? Yeah, okay. You got 20 more years, buddy, you get to serve here. That's so. But I just wanted to honor them because if I could teach this message and name a person, it'd be this guy right here. Um, awesome. And his lovely wife, their kids are some of our kids' best friends. And we just thank God for you. You've been a gift. We love you. Appreciate you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, I mean, just that's, that's a living message right there. But I close with this, and, and that is number four. If you do anything, leave a legacy of prayer. Be a praying person and pray for those people that you love and let those people know that you love, that you are a praying person. Because here's what Paul says in the letter. He says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, Conscience. Notice he says, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears as long as I long to see you so that I might be filled with joy. In this moment, Timothy was upset because Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. It wouldn't be long after Paul wrote this letter that Paul would be martyred for the faith. And they knew it. Paul knew it. Timothy knew it. So Timothy was very upset because his spiritual father, his mentor, really his father, was about ready to be martyred and Timothy was very upset and he wrote this to comfort him. And he said, listen, I want you to know that I pray for you day and night. One of the greatest legacies you can leave is a legacy of prayer. You know, there's a man that I've often read of and he was a man by the name of George Mueller. He lived in Bristol, England back in the late 1800s. During that time, there was orphans all over the city streets and he didn't have any, he had two pennies in his pocket, two pence, they call it in England. And he was looking at all these homeless children and he prayed a prayer. He said, God, if you will help me help these children, you got me. And from that day forward, he started praying about opening an orphanage, 
to help these kids. And lo and behold, he did it. And he said, God, I'm not gonna go beg for money. I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna believe you to meet all of our needs. And man, he has got some hair-raising stories of answered prayer that I don't have time to go into this morning. But over the course of 60 years, he housed, fed, and sent on their way 10,000 children and he never asked for a dollar. He built eight buildings to house these kids and he would pray and God would answer. He would pray and God would answer. At the end of his life, after he passed away, his daughter found his prayer journal. He had a journal where he recorded all of his prayers. The prayer journal was 3,000 pages long. And his daughter went through and counted every answered prayer. When she got to the end of the journal, she had counted over 30,000 answered prayers prayers. Is that incredible or what? You want to talk about a legacy that he left? You want to ever doubt the power of prayer? Here's my prayer journal. And when you look at how you and I live, that's what makes the greatest impact. So here's my final thought of all thoughts, my final closing of all my closings. The best legacy to leave is not money and fortune and earthly possessions that we're not going to take with us. The greatest legacy you and I could ever leave is a godly one. Amen? That's God's heart for you and I. And I hope from this day forward, you will take that seriously. How am I impacting those around me? How will I be remembered? What kind of wake is my life leaving as I go to be with Jesus? Amen? Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for each and every person here. I just say a special prayer this morning. The Lord, you would help all of us. I pray for myself included that we could run our race in such a way that we leave a wake behind us that will touch generations, that our kids and grandkids and future generations will be impacted for you by the way we lived our lives. Help us to be conscious of that. Help us to be purposeful about that. And Lord, I, I pray for those here that are feeling guilt, that maybe are, are seeing how they, the legacy they've left and it's not been what they hoped it would be. I pray that they would feel your grace today, that they'd feel your forgiveness today. And that Lord, they could just take steps from this day forward to start impacting those around them positively. Lord, we thank you for this today in Jesus' name. And lastly, before we go is, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you today, have you ever made Jesus the Lord of your life? It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. You might be here today saying, you know, I'm not a follower of Christ. Well, today you can make that decision right now to leave that legacy and live that life. And it's as simple as putting your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. He paid the price. He took the penalty for our sin. He paid the price for us to be reconciled back to the Father. If you've never done that, can I invite you to do that with me here today? With every head bowed, every eye closed. I just ask everybody to pray it whether you need it or not so the people that do need it could jump in with us this morning. Could we all pray it together? Could we just say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I put my faith in you today as my personal Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.